We're going to open our meeting with uh, a quiet time and follow it with the set-aside prayer. God, please help me set aside everything I think I know about myself, the 12 steps, the big book, the meetings, my disease, and you, God, so I may have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please let me see the truth. Amen. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the third step. Step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Now this step begins with the third paragraph on page 60. We're going to page 60, third paragraph. Now how do we know that? Well, in this case, the big book authors tell us so. And then we're going to read, it's page 60, it's right after the ABCs and how it works. It says, being convinced we were at step three, which is that we decided to turn our will and our life over to God as we understood him. Just what... Just what do we mean by that, and just what do we do? Convinced of what? If, it's, if we've taken the second step, we believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. But even though we may believe that God is the answer, this doesn't necessarily mean that we're willing to accept this solution. In order to recover from alcoholism, we must make a decision to put God's power to work in our lives. Now let's break down the third step into simpler terms. First, I make a decision. Second, I follow through my decision with some action. First, I decided to come here today. Second, I had to take some action to get here. Now, my will is my thinking, and all actions are born in thought. My life is my behavior or my actions. So we're going to make a decision to turn our thinking and our actions over to the care of a higher power. Now, we want you to take a look at your handout number five. Brian's being my Vanna White here. God's going to suffer. It's on the back of the third step prayer. On the back of the third step prayer. Yeah. Looks just like this here. It says God's will self will on it. It says God's will self will on it. So what we're talking about is we turn our thinking and our actions by first checking our, turn over our thinking and our actions by first checking our thinking. We simply ask ourselves, is it selfish or not? In other words, we think before we act. Not always easy for alcoholics. (laughs) On page 60 again, in the fourth paragraph, We're going to see how operating on self-will keeps us separated from God and our fellows. This is a primary problem we have. They also explain that when we live on self-will, we are like actors trying to control every details of a play. So I just want to say for a minute, in that handout it says, you know, third step is about selfishness and unselfishness. So the first thing we're going to read about is all about selfishness, and then we'll read about being unselfish and what that's like. So it says, the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we are always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show. He's forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of his players in his own way. If the arrangements would only stay put... If only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased. Life would be wonderful. But in trying to make these arrangements, our actor may sometimes be quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest or self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But as with most humans, he is more likely to have varied traits. Does this sound familiar? Anybody? Show of hands. (laughs) It's all right, you can admit it. (laughs) At one time or another, haven't we all tried to convince those around us that they'd be much better off if they just did things our way? (laughs) 
Attempting to control others is one of the characteristics of self-centeredness. Some call this playing God. Now, in the first paragraph on page 62, two pages up, we see how self-centeredness blocks us from our connection with our higher power and gets us into trouble. It says, selfish, so, selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles, driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us seemingly without provocation. But we invariably find that in some time in the past, we have made decisions based on self, which later place us in a position to be hurt. So our trouble, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves. And the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though he usually doesn't think so. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of selfishness. We must or it kills us. God makes that possible. And there often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. Neither could we have reduced our self-centeredness much, much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. And then in the next paragraph, it's made clear what happens once we rid ourselves of this selfishness and live in God's will. This is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. Next, we decided that, decided that hereafter in the drama of life, God is going to be our director. He is the principal. We are the agents. He is the father. We are the children. Most good ideas are simple, and this concept was a keystone of a new and triumphant march through which we passed to freedom. When we sincerely took such a position, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer, being all-powerful, he provided what we needed if we kept close to him and performed his work well. Once we step aside and put our higher power in the center, we're amazed at how much better our lives become. As we become aware of the realm of the spirit, our lives change. Once we make this decision to live in God's will, some promises will start to come true. We're going to start with the next line down, and here we're going to read the third step promises. It says, established on such a footing, we became less and less inter interested in ourselves, our plans and designs. More and more, we became interested in seeing what we could contribute to life. As we felt new power flow in, as we enjoyed peace of mind, as we discovered we could face life successfully, as we become presence, conscious of his presence, we began to lose our fear of tomorrow, today, tomorrow, or the hereafter, we were reborn. We're, we were reborn. Now they're writing about the rebirth of our thinking. We start changing the way we think by using the God's will versus self-will test. We go from being self-directed to God-directed. Now let's go to the third paragraph. We found it very desirable to take the spiritual step with an understanding person, such as a wife, best friend, or spiritual advisor. But it's better to meet God alone than with one who might misunderstand. The wording was, of course, quite, optionable, quite optional, as long as we expressed the idea, voicing it without reservation. This was only a beginning, though, if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a great one, was felt at once. Okay, there's three frogs sitting on a log. <laughs> that got your attention. I saw everybody's head jump up. All right, one decides to jump off. How many are left? Very good. Three, exactly. You guys are sharp. All right. Now, although the wording for taking step three is optional, we're provided with a prayer that we can use to take the third step. Now, Brian is going to read this prayer to us first, and then we're going to gather in a circle, and we're going to um, read this prayer together. Okay, it says, We were now at step three. Many of us said to our Maker, as we understood him, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thy will. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy, that I would help of thy power, thy love, thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Okay, let's get up and form a circle. And now you do have this on one of your, your handouts, so if you can lay them around on the table so that we can see... One big circle.
God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Amen. Congratulations, we've done the third step. Now, if we can just be seated for one minute. I want you to know that we have completed the surrender process by taking the first three steps. Now, this is a remarkable accomplishment. Congratulations. Step four. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. In the fourth paragraph, we're getting back on page 63. We get to work. Okay, we're getting to work now. Page 63, fourth paragraph. Next, we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step, which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. Though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once, followed by a strenuous effort to face and rid of of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to the causes and conditions. We must take the fourth step immediately after the third step. We don't put it off indefinitely. Since alcohol is only a symptom of our problem, when we take it away, we find that our shortcomings still separate us from our higher power. Alcoholism is largely about our inability to have healthy and effective relationships with God, ourselves, and others. Now it's time to take an inventory of these blocks that get in the way of our relationships. Now let's go to the first paragraph on page 64. Therefore, we started upon a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. A business, wait, wait. This taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It is an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to discover damaged or unsalable goods to get rid of them properly without regret. If an owner of a business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. So we're going to take a look at our liabilities and our assets. That's what a commercial inventory is all about. We want to discover what behaviors and thinking patterns are working in our favor and which are not. Now the second paragraph tells us how. We did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First, we searched out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure. The unconvinced itself, manifested in various ways, was what had defeated us. We considered its common manifestations. Before we get into the details, we want to make some important points. First, there is no right or wrong way to search out the flaws in our makeup which caused our failure except not to do it at all. Now, second, the commercial inventory precedes the three-column inventory. Now, because it comes first, we assume they're asking us to utilize this simple checklist before attempting the more difficult example on page 65. Third, Dr. Bob, our co-founder, used an assets and liabilities checklist for 15 years. He took newcomers through the steps as quickly as possible and often completed the process during the person's three to five day stay at the hospital, like Brian talked about earlier. We too are urged to take the steps quickly. This doesn't mean we take it once and we're done. Of course, this is a beginning and we go on and practice for the rest of our lives. Now thousands of alcoholics continue to recover by following Dr. Bob's keep it simple approach. When we keep it simple, we can easily grasp the message, experience the miracle, and grow into the fellowship of the Spirit. Each time we either take the steps or help someone else through the steps, we conduct another inventory. And this helps us stay active in our life-saving program. We learn to rely on God rather than on ourselves to solve our problems. We must discover the truth about the stock and trade in order to remove those behaviors that have cut us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. 
Now, from page 64 to 71, we're presented with a list of faults we need to eliminate. We're going to talk about some of those. In the third paragraph, we're going to start on page 64. And he, uh, in the third paragraph on 64, they ask us to examine our resentments first. It says, resentment is number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease. For we, have not, for we have been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. In dealing with resentments, we set them on paper. We listed people, institutions, or principles with whom we were angry. We asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, it was found that our self-esteem, our pocketbooks, our ambitions, our personal relationships, including sex, were hurt or threatened. So we were sore. We were burned up. Our goal is to correct the spiritual sickness that has separated us from the God of our understanding and doomed us until now to the living hell of alcoholism. How do we overcome this malady? We have a psychic change, a spiritual awakening or experience as the result of taking the 12 steps. At the bottom of this page, they've provided us with more details. It says, we went back through our lives, nothing counted but thoroughness and honesty. When we were finished, we considered it carefully. The first thing apparent was that this world and its people were often quite wrong. To conclude that others was wrong was as far as most of us ever got. The usual outcome was that people continued to wrong us and we stayed sore. Sometimes it was remorse and then we were sore at ourselves. But the more we fought and tried to have our own way, the worse matters got. As in war, the victor only seemed to win. Our moments of triumph were short-lived. Please note, we're asked to be thorough, and in the next sentence, they tell us what to do when we're finished. Since this is in one paragraph, we assume they are asking us to complete this inventory in one sitting, not in a, over a period of six months. Now, they also point out that blaming others was as far as most of us ever got. It's a lot more comfortable that way, but not very efficient. Now, we must stop pointing the finger. In the next paragraph, we find that our resentments keep us separated from our higher power. We must eliminate them if we are to have a spiritual awakening. It is plain that a life which includes deep resentment leads only to fertility and unhappiness to the precise extent that we permit these do we squander the hours that might have been worthwhile. But with the alcoholic, whose hope is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely grave. We found that it is fatal. For when harboring such feelings, we shut ourselves off from the sunlight of the spirit. The insanity of alcohol returns, and we drink again. And with us, to drink is to die. Okay, in the next paragraph, it is further emphasized how important it is to let go of the resentments. If we don't, we stay spiritually sick. If we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be a dubious luxury of normal men, but for alcoholics, these things are poison. We are given specific instructions on what to do about our resentments. We must get beyond them if we expect to live long or happy in this world. They also explain that when we hold on to grudges, they are, we are actually allowing others to control our thinking and our actions. Start with the next line down. It says, we turn back to the list, for it held a key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and its people really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoings of others, fancied or real, had the power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw that these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. Okay, if we don't deal with our resentments, our future will be a repeat of the past. Every time we are reminded of an old hurt, the old pain returns and we re-feel the anger again and again. In the past, we may have, had, may have drunk to numb this pain, but now we are going to take action to eliminate it. We talk about our resentments with our sponsor or sharing partner. Healing starts with the sharing of the hurt. But the healing is not complete until we forgive those who have offended us. Therefore, we overcome resentments with forgiveness. Our attitude about the experience will change. We see the source of our pain from a new perspective, from a new perspective. We see the people, wait, we see the person is a sick individual who needs our prayers, not our anger. Whether it's a person in our present life, someone who has passed on, 
someone we may have never we may never see again or ourselves the process is still the same i'm going to go down to the next next line it says this was our course we realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick though we did not like their symptoms and the way these disturbed us they like ourselves were sick too we will strengthen the virtues of tolerance, pity, and patience when we forgive those who have wronged us. We refer to this as the anger prayer. The next line down. It says, We ask God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. When a person offended, we said to ourselves, This is a sick man. How can I be helpful to him? God save me from being angry. Thy will be done. We avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat sick people that way. If we do, we destroy our chances of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. So we overcome our resentments with forgiveness, and we learn to forgive others by praying for them. Then in the next paragraph, we're instructed to look beyond blaming others. We look to see where we were wrong in each situation to then decide if we need to make amends. Referring to the list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. Where have we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person's involvement entirely. Where are we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly, and we're willing to set these matters straight. Let's look at that third sentence again. They asked, where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Let's go back to handout number five. That's on the opposite side of... The third, the third step prayer. And we're going to take a look at the fourth step test. Selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, and fear are the shortcomings based on self-will. They are the opposites of unselfishness, honesty, purity, and love or faith. And these assets are based on God's will. We use this test to examine our thinking and our actions. Remember, we're changing. We want to have God live in our life by helping us change our thinking and our actions. We may have done nothing to cause the anger, and we're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. Our part may be that we're still holding on to and refeeling anger and hurting ourselves. I've heard it said that resentments are like uh, taking poison and expecting the other person to die. Now we can either use the AA test, or good, somebody heard that. <laughs> Now, we can use either the AA test for self-will or the four standards as a test for God's will to determine if we need to set right the wrong and be forgiving. Early on, Bill W., Dr. Bob, and the other AA pioneers tested everything that they thought, said, or did. I didn't know this for a long time until we've done some research. Now they're asking us to do the same thing test our thinking and our actions with the four standards. We need to know which path we're on. Are we living in the solution and walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe? Or are we living in the problem and sinking deeper and deeper into that bitter morass of self-pity? It is our selfish self-centeredness that keeps us blocked from the one who has all power and prevents us from finding the spiritual solution to our difficulties. So in step four, we use the liabilities of selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, and frightened as a means to identify where we've been acting in self-will. Now next, the authors ask us to look at our fears. In the last paragraph, we read about fear. It says, notice the word fear. And I'll go down two lines. It says, this short word somehow touches every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us 
misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did we did not with but did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. In the next paragraph, we're given more directions. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper. Even though we had no resentment in connection with them, we asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was, was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. If we have faith that God will keep us safe and protected, we will receive the strength and direction to co- overcome all our fears. In the second paragraph on page 68, they inform us that we will lose our fears if we trust our higher power. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so, for, your, for we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us, and humbly rely on him. Does he enable us to match, to match calamity with serenity? In the next paragraph, we're given more directions on how to rid ourselves of these fears by relying upon God for guidance. It says, We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. We overcome fear with faith. Our faith grows through prayer. The following line reads, Now about sex. Did you all hear that? Did you wake up? Now about sex. The big book authors write two pages about our unhealthy conduct that we need to look at. And as far as I know, I'm the only one who goes around the country and tackles this, but I'm I'm brave. (laughs) Yeah. Now they mention one or more additional uh, shortcomings and how we have harmed others. Now on the next page, go two lines up from the first paragraph. Two lines up from the first paragraph, it says, We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where have we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. Excuse that. Okay. Now, the authors ask us to put all this down on paper and look at it. Where do we cause jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness? This will become our immense list. The people to whom we need to make restitution. The additional shortcoming mentioned is inconsideration. In the next paragraph, we're asked to use the third step test to see if we need to make amends. We're asked to use that third step test in our relationships. Okay, it says, in this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test. Was it selfish or not? We asked God to mold our ideals and help us to live up to them. We remember always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. Okay, there are only two healthy reasons to have sex. Anybody know what they are? Anybody dare? Look at you all clam up. (laughs) See, we all have sex problems. To have kids. Well, I heard one of them. Okay. To have kids, that's right, procreation, got to keep the species going. All right, what else? Pleasure. Pleasure. It's okay, folks. I'm giving you permission to enjoy it if you want. All right, now, we're going to, but the key is, the key word is mutual 
pleasure. Oh, yeah, we have to think of other people. All right. Now, if we check our conduct, whatever it is, even if it's sexual conduct, if we check our conduct with the four standards, the four absolutes, and we pass the test, only then are we acting in God's will. But we have to be sure. And if we're not sure, we better check with our sponsor and do some prayer about it, because we do not want to go around life causing more harm. Now we ask our higher power to help us mold our ideals and to help us live up to them. In the next paragraph, we're again instructed to seek God's help. It says, whatever our ideals turn out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation... We ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. Now go down two lines to the next paragraph and here we're told that if we are sorry for our unhealthy conduct and we want to change we sincerely want to change our higher power will forgive us now it's time to forgive ourselves so suppose we fall short of our chosen ideals and stumble does that mean we're going to get drunk some people tell us so but this is only half truth it depends upon us and our motives if we are sorry for what we have done and have an honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven, and we will have learned a lesson. If we are not sorry, and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. Our goal is to be helpful. Keep that in mind, not harmful. We're then instructed to correct all of our poor conduct through prayer. It says... To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves a harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge and when to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We've commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look upon them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. See, that's a big part of what our our transformation of thought and attitude, our spiritual awakening is, when we truly are able to look towards all mankind with love and tolerance. What a beautiful feeling that is. It's just an amazing thing when we start to feel like maybe we belong in this world after all and we're just another person trying to do the best we can. You know, it's a great feeling. All right, now in the last line they state that if we confess our former ill feelings and express our regret, God will remove the blocks that have separated us from the sunlight of the Spirit. It says, in this book you read again and again that faith did for us what we could do what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self loathes and blocking you off for him. If you have already made a decision and an inventory of your grocery handicaps, you have made a good beginning. And that being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. Yeah, we, we should go to the example now. We're going to turn to the example. Now, if you look, you're going to see an inventory sheet that already has check marks on That's simply our sample page. Okay, we overcome resentments with forgiveness. That's the opposite. We do that through prayer. We overcome fear with faith. The opposite of fear is faith, which develops through prayer. We correct selfishness with unselfish acts. We change our actions. We overcome dishonesty with honest acts. We change our actions. When we check our thoughts and our actions against the four standards of honesty, purity, unselfishness and love, 
we overcome the wrong thinking associated with false pride. So our inventory consists of a list of liabilities to watch for and assets to strive for. In order to simplify the inventory process even further, we're going to go over this sample sheet more specifically. We list organizations and individuals that we have to consider when we make a drastic self-appraisal. We do that across the top of the page in those open slots. These may include family members, friends, co-workers, government officials, prisons, sanitariums, maybe God, your higher power, religion, perhaps yourself. And then feel free to add others as they come up during your fifth step when you're sharing. Now start with, then you, you would start with the first name on our list. We need to, want you to just follow this for now. We'll start writing in a minute. Just follow, the one, follow where it says mother. See that? The first one on the list says mother. Then move down the list of liabilities asking yourself these questions. And this helps to have the inventory or the, um, the definitions in front of you while we do this. You ask yourself questions like, am I angry toward her? Did I avoid doing things that she asked me to do? Have I been dishonest with her? Am I afraid of her or afraid of where our relationship is going? Have I been inconsiderate? Do I feel better than or less than my mother? Did I unjustifiably, did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness in her by my actions? And so we put the check marks next to the liabilities that you associate with the names at the top of the sheet. Then one continues across the top asking these questions for each name and organization and situation. We make check marks until we've discovered our grosser handicaps, our patterns. You're going to see more check marks on some things and less than others. So then we take our blank, in blank inventory sheet which is on the other side, and we find it easiest to fold over the assets because we're only going to mark down our liabilities. We can get confused if we see the assets showing up. We're only going to check the liabilities. Turn it over and see how Brian's done it. Just fold it back. And then we go over them later. We're going to go over them later. So then we write down what's... We're going to go over the assets later. Now. What we're going to do is write down only what's on your mind today, right now. We're going to be current. You just do the best that you can right now. Every day you do an inventory, it's going to be a little bit different than another day. We're not always spiritually fit, 100%. Okay, now you needn't list things from your past that you've already resolved or are already working on to be thorough. You know, we just want... We're looking for past situations. If there's something from the past, we look at those situations that continue to poison our current thinking and behavior. If there's something from the past that's still causing us to cause ourselves trouble, then that goes on there. Now, the object of this inventory is to learn what our major character defects are. That's the, that's the point. So we don't have to recall every incident to make our inventory accurate. When other people, places, or things come up from your past, then you add them to your inventory. We're just as thorough as we're able to be today. So um, now remember, this is not about how others have harmed us. It's so easy to do that, to write down, oh, ex-husband, oh, yeah, he was selfish, and start putting that down or whatever. No, no, this is about me. Now, we believe that this is a spiritual exercise, not a mental one. So we don't have to think about this. This program is a spiritual program. We don't have to start racking our brains. Our higher power will guide us. What we're going to do is we're going to read a prayer, and then we're going to sit quietly and fill out this sheet as best we can right now. Take five minutes is all we're going to take. Five minutes so we can get ourselves started, and most of you will finish within that time, even if you haven't done an inventory before. So we're going to sit quietly to f and fill out this inventory. And if you need more than one inventory sheet, it's okay. You won't be the first. A lot of people have had more than what's on this page. Now, um, please ask questions now to help anybody else who may not quite understand what we're doing. Yes, Mike. Today, we're inventory what bothers us today. 
absolutely whatever is blocking us today from having a healthy relationship with our higher power and those around us. A red flag is, am I having trouble with such and such, my neighbor? Am I having trouble with my job? Am I having trouble with my daughter? You see, those are currently pro current problems. What is going on right now? Our character defects come from various places from the past and various things. All we need to do is see what's upsetting us today. I hope that's clear. Remember, if you've, already, if you've had something that you already have worked on or resolved, it is not currently affecting your thinking and your behavior today. We just want to find out what is blocking us from our higher power and from our, our fellows right now. Another question. Okay, now please be, oh, one more question, yes. We do not have to write down specific incidences. If you have an incident and you can say just something like it's about job, then all you have to do is say job. Because when we are, you just check that off. Because when we're doing our fifth step, we say, let me tell you what's happening at my job. And then you go over that. You'll remember. If you know it now, you're going to know it by lunchtime. <laughs> Another question. No, we're going through all of them. We're doing one at a time. You see, you start at the top, and you'll say one person or incident at a time, and then run down the whole thing and say, hmm, do I resent them? Am I selfish with them? Have I been dishonest? Am I afraid? Where have I been inconsiderate? Am I acting like I'm better than or less than? You see? You go down each one, then the next one. Am I resentful? Am I selfish? Am I dishonest? You see? Okay, so we're going down the list. You, does that make it clear? And then we are going to write down anything that comes to mind, put the definitions of the liabilities in front of you to help you think of anything that may come to mind. Your higher power will guide you in this. Don't worry, you're going to get this. But we need to be considerate and be quiet for others. Okay, here is our prayer. God. I pray for my fears to be replaced by faith. I pray to be thorough and honest as I am guided through this simple spiritual exercise. Please let me see the truth about myself that I may continue on a path of spiritual growth. Amen. We'll let you know when five minutes is up. So those, to those who have finished writing, you have now completed step four. This is an inventory sheet that's very thorough. Congratulations. <laughs> Some of you look a little doubtful. That was too darn simple, right? Well, it's okay. We can do that. We can keep it simple. Now we want you to... Uh, we want you to do some circling on this page. We want you to look at your inventory. And we want you to circle the liabilities that have the most check marks. If you only have a few things all together, then those are going to be circled. But if you have two on, on one thing and you have 17 on another, then you check that other one, okay? We want to look for our grosser handicaps. Not, we want to find the patterns here because it isn't the incidences that we're trying to discover. We want to learn what our liabilities are. The characteristics that have the most check marks, these are the character defects that are preventing you from having healthier relationships with your higher power and these individuals right now. Now, even though we've done some very foolish and destructive things while drinking, we will never have to repeat these actions, provided we're willing to admit our faults and correct them. It's time to forgive ourselves. Now, starting in the second paragraph on page 72, we're going to read a little bit more here. Second paragraph on page 72. Here it's explained why we must admit our liabilities to another person. Second paragraph, page 72. This is perhaps difficult, especially discussing our defects with another person. We think we have done well enough in admitting these things to ourselves. There is doubt about that. In actual practice, we usually find a solidarity, self-appraisal, insufficient. 
Many of us thought it necessary to go much further. We will be more reclined to discuss ourselves with another person when we see good reason why we should do so. The best reason first. If we skip this vital step, we may never overcome drinking. Time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. Trying to avoid this humbling experience, they have tried easier methods. Almost invariably, they got drunk. Having persevered with the rest of the program, they wonder why they fell. We think the reason is that they never completed their house cleaning. They took inventory all right, but hung on to some of the worst items in stock. They only thought they lost their egotism and fear. They only thought they had humbled themselves. But they have not learned enough humility, fearlessness, and honesty in the sense we find it necessary until they told someone else their entire life story. We must share our inventories because we're great at self-deception. Aren't we the ones who used to say we didn't have a drinking problem? Didn't we tell ourselves over and over that we were doing fine as we're sinking deeper and deeper into the abyss of alcoholism? Since we're not good judges of character, especially our own, I hate that, we confide in someone else. But, you know, it's true. I'm not a real good judge of character. Now, only another person can see us as we really are. That's why we really have to share this with somebody else. Your sharing partner needs to be close-mouthed, trustworthy, supportive, and must never discuss our inventories with anyone else. Starting with the third line up from the bottom of page 74, we'll read about that. It says it is important that he be able to keep confidence, that he fully understand and approve of what we are driving at, that he will not try to change our plan, but we must not use this as a mere excuse to postpone. Here we're given specific instructions for taking the fifth step. In the first paragraph on page 75, next page, uh, we're told that as soon as we decide who we're going to talk to, we take action immediately. And this is a precise direction here. It says, when we decide who is to hear our story, we waste no time. We're now well on our way toward recovering from alcoholism. We are, in fact, in the process of having a spiritual experience. As the results of this psychic change, our obsession to drink will be removed. So we have one assignment during our lunch break, and that's to share our inventory sheet that you just filled out with your partner. Also, we want you to talk over together each person, principal, or institution listed at the top of the sheet to see if you need to make amends. That's an important part of this. Go over that and see, do you need to have a change of thought and attitude? Do you need to have a new viewpoint? Imagine walking in that person's shoes, or do we need to make amends in a way where we have to make restitution? It's important that you go over that. Now, you use the God's will and self-will handout to help you decide. You see, am I following along the four absolutes? If I'm not, then what do I need to do? And a nine times out of ten prayer is what it's about. Right, our inventory sheet says self-will on the, on the uh, liability side, and it says God's will in the asset side. That's, by the way, how you always know whether you're living in God's will or self-will. Just go down the list. You may adjust the check marks on your inventory as you share because someone else can see the truth more clearly than we can see ourselves. Somebody might say, I think that was selfish, and it needs to be put there. You know, I mean, we have to, we help each other go over this, do this together. Now then when you're done, you will have com- completed the fifth step. Then afterwards, we ask that please take a few minutes by yourself Take some time by yourself to reflect on this inventory to be sure that you haven't left anything out. And then we want you to save these assets and liabilities checklists and bring them back with you because we're going to need them when we come back. Now are there any questions on how to do this fifth step? You can, uh, I already said that. You can also, uh, um, if you want to sit outside or find a corner, you know, to do this so you have a little bit of privacy, we find that people always find a little niche somewhere and are able to do this. And besides, we're self-centered enough to not be listening to what's going on in the table next to us. <laughs> so what you have in front of you now with this inventory sheet is who you are right now, right this minute. This is an accurate assessment, the truth. You now know which behaviors and thinking patterns are working for you and which are not. 
This is empowering, don't you think? I think it's very empowering. Now we are entering the phase of the program where more and more actions are required. These actions produce results. Many of these results are in the form of promises which, as our lives change, become an integral part of our spiritual being. Now, once we admit our wrongs, our lives will change. We begin to experience a transformation of thought and attitude. Um, Now, we're going to get back in the book and go to page 75, starting with the second line and the second paragraph. They describe some of these changes. Hi, my name is Cindy, and I'm an alcoholic. Fifth step promises. Once we have taken this step with holding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We may have certain spiritual beliefs, but now we can begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Thank you, Cindy. Good job. Now, if our lives didn't get better, why would we want to stay sober? If all we had to look forward to were restlessness, irritability, and discontentment, why do the work? AA offers so much more than just freedom from alcohol. We have found a new way of living far more beautiful than anything we could have ever imagined. That's why we take the steps, and that's why we take them again and again. Now we're in the process of having a spiritual experience. As the result of the psychic change, our obsession to drink is being removed. In the next paragraph, after our promises, we learn what to do after we have shared our inventories. It reads, Returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour, carefully reviewing what we have done. I hope some of you had the opportunity to sit quietly a little bit after you did this and and think about what you'd written. Now we thank God from the bottom of our hearts that we know him better. Taking this book down from the shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. Carefully reading the first five proposals, we ask if we have omitted anything, for we are building an arch through which we shall walk a free man at last. Is our work solid so far? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skimped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? During the fourth step, we identified our shortcomings using the assets and liabilities checklist. Now in the sixth step, we make the preparations necessary to turn these shortcomings over to our higher power. We are instructed to review the first five steps to make sure we haven't omitted anything. And if you have done this, you're ready to proceed to the sixth step. 